In order to understand some of the discourse around the Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, we need to understand why gamers even think that way or even have this model in the first place that it just looks like it's DLC or that it looks like it's an expansion to the original Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. So today's online distribution model of PSN, Xbox Store, the eShop, it's never been easier to get content to new players. Gamers can hop online and download new games, maps, weapons, and more from the comfort of their own house and begin playing quickly or right away. This was a far cry from the industry that I grew up in where when you wanted a new game, you had to physically get up, go get the game. I mean, it was something that was surreal at this point with so many people downloading games, but back then it was always you have to go out there and get it, get up, go get the game. A hot new sequel released, the only way to get it was to go to the store and buy it. And developers went all out on trying to attract gamers to their products in stores. It was nuts back in the day. Sequels to big selling games were always predominantly advertised in stores and through print media. And publishers wanted to know, hey, look at this sequel. This is a really good game. You're going to like it. Buy it. But with the rise of digital distribution, publishers and developers were able to cut out that middleman just a bit, not even just a bit, a lot, and sell their games directly to the consumer. Now, at first it started out with smaller titles on console. The original Xbox had a built-in hard drive, which really revolutionized the industry because by connecting to Xbox Live Arcade, players could download smaller games to their system and play. Now, Sony and Microsoft, not to be content, followed suit, developing PSN and WiiWare respectively, giving gamers access to high-quality titles digitally, no extra hardware needed. As the years went on, digital distribution took many forms. Developers packed games with extra content to purchase, and as hard drives got bigger, full-priced retail games became available to download as well, and digital distribution revenue skyrocketed. Guys, we cannot underestimate how much money, how much more money developers have made off of digital distribution. Now, publishers were keen to keep on taking advantage and giving gamers direct access to content in their favorite games digitally. Now, gamers were treated to large scale expansions that felt like new games from the old. This would usually be like a sequel if it was like a Mega Man 1 to 2 to 3, but essentially you got a slice of that and an expansion to a game that you already owned. Popular titles such as The Witcher 3, The Elder Scrolls Skyrim, Grand Theft Auto, Xenoblade Chronicles 2, Splatoon, and so many more have done this. Get you that big slice of gameplay, downloadable expansion that feels great to play and innovates on a number of things from what was presented in the original base game. Now, these large-scale expansions or DLC use the same graphics and engine, but often improved on the base formula so much. They included new party members, weapons, locations, and more. Some felt like brand new games. This is where I think the Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom confusion comes in. Gamers are so used to getting large-scale expansions that blur the lines of a sequel and an add-on content to their favorite games. When they see a sequel greatly improve the base formula or they don't see enough at first, many might cry foul. With the law of diminishing returns hitting harder and bearing down more than ever before with today's graphics, this it's just DLC argument from gamers happens more often than not unless a game is a completely new IP or remake. So for example, multiple videos and comments were made from gamers about God of War Ragnarok and Splatoon 3 being just DLC. That's despite both games adding a brand new story, new weapons, locations, themes, improved graphics, and more. With the dominance of digital distribution and DLC, if you don't drastically change your game's looks or gameplay, it's just DLC comments and videos will come near instantly without even getting all the information on the game. Now, to be honest, this is just a small vocal minority of the overall gaming environment. Some of it can be attributed to content creators looking to make a quick payday, but it's still out there nonetheless. Now, God of War Ragnarok and Splatoon 3 have both sold over 10 million units easily, and gamers love all the new additions to the game, so it's not like this sediment of it's just DLC is reciprocated with all gamers out there. Now, here comes The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, a direct sequel 
to the best-selling Zelda game of all time, a game that's heralded as one of the best games of all time, a title that changed a lot of the typical 3D Zelda conventions to make a much different game that fans were used to from back in the N64 days with the Ocarina of Time. That initial shock of getting something so different in scope and scale is still here. And with The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom's six-year development cycle, I think some expected Link to be in space or something like that, or at least to be instantly noticeable in terms of drastic changes to the formula of the game. Now, Nintendo has been drip-feeding us information on the title for the past four years since it was revealed at E3 2019, so naturally there will be skeptical people out there. But from even the small slices of gameplay we've been shown, it's very clear to me, at least, that this sequel sets out to not only fix the issues with the previous game, but make a name for itself in various different ways. And while everything I'm talking about isn't confirmed, there is plenty of hints and evidence to piece together The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom is aiming to surpass Breath of the Wild in every single way possible and not by a small amount, by a very large amount. Now the goal of a direct sequel isn't always to upend the tea table Miyamoto style, like The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, which only got one year to develop because Nintendo was like, hey, get this done or else. We're not giving you any more budget for anything more than that. But sometimes it's to drastically improve upon all of the aspects of a game from a gameplay and narrative perspective for these massive sequels. Now, I feel this is the goal with The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. For example, Breath of the Wild was heavily criticized for its weak narrative in comparison to Zelda games. Tears of the Kingdom from the jump has emphasized story will be a focal point with the dramatic rise of Ganon, the epic fall of Princess Zelda, story will play a major role in this game. This was further driven home by the introduction from the Zelda 2 trailer at the February Nintendo Direct. Ganon's declaration to seek revenge, the Blood Moon, and the air of mysteries surrounding Link with his champion's tunic compared to a more rugged, long-haired Link. The crafting of an incredible story and with gameplay to back it up is an incredibly difficult process and not something that can be done overnight, especially if you plan on players putting over 100 hours into your game. Now, another criticism of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild was the enemy variety. And while I thought it was solid, I understand how some felt it was a little weak. But after the recent trailer, it's clear Nintendo wanted to show off not only new enemy types, but returning favorites as well, like Redeads. They also showed off how some enemies will interact with each other to team up against Link. This is just a small slice of what is to come. And I feel there is a lot more to show on this in the future trailers of the game. But we need to discuss other things in terms of the improvements as well that I think that we are going to see from some of the stuff that the trailer did show off. So another criticism with The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is the weapons and the weapon breaking. Well, it definitely seems like things have been retooled quite a bit because they showed off a bunch of weapons in the trailer. And one of the things that it looks like The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom does is that it adds craftable weapons. You can clearly see a spark of light and then also an arrow or a bow and arrow that shifts and maneuvers and tracks towards the enemy. That's something that you could never even dream of doing in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. And it makes complete sense to me because in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, you could upgrade your armor. There was crafting and upgrading associated with your armor. So it makes sense that they say, okay, let's take that over to the weapons, which could solve another thing that the fans were split on when it comes to The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, and that is weapon durability. Will the weapon break? Will it not? Some people felt that it added a layer of difficulty to the game because it seems the game is a bit easy, especially on the normal difficulty and not playing on master mode. So it does add that extra layer of strategy in there, while others said that it completely hampers the experience and the fact that anytime that you get weapons that you like, you don't want to use them because they'll break in a few hits. So I think that you can balance this with a great weapon crafting system for those 
who want to use it as how it was before and not upgrade and just continue to plow through weapons and have them break, they can do that. But for those who want to upgrade their weapons and have them last longer or fix them, they'll be able to have that as well. So I think that you could serve both audiences here. Now, next up is shrines and dungeons. Now, those were also split as well. I absolutely love the shrines because they were not mandatory. If you wanted to seek them out and do puzzles like The Legend of Zelda is always known for, then you can. If you don't want to do them and just continue on with the experience and fight and explore, you can it gave you all of the freedom to get that done but it does seem like shrines will be back in the legend of zelda tears of the kingdom although a little bit of a different way but it also seems like dungeons could be making its way back in some way shape or form there could be open-ended sky dungeons where you go up and you do different things in the sky pertaining to a dungeon or even massive underground areas, which they have shown off, that could be labyrinth in style, and you have dungeon-like gameplay there. So I think that crafting all of this, when it comes to the big story, when it comes to the weapons, when it comes to the shrines and dungeons, and trying to make a cohesive game built on top of everything that you've already done, it just balloons into a game that's going to be a lot more massive than anybody even thinks at this point. Now, next up, vehicles being added. And I think that not only are the fact that vehicles being added in a type of way, but it seems that they're going to be improving upon all of the custom and weird things that gamers did without them maybe even knowing. So for example, you saw videos of people making their own homemade contraptions and moving about in certain ways. And in Tears of the Kingdom, they're like, hey, well, how about we give you tools to be able to make certain vehicles to where you can just do it within the game. And they only showed us two of them. They showed us the sky maneuvering mobile and they showed us that big old huge like four wheeler or whatever that thing was that Link was driving. And that's cool, but I think that there might even be more in the game and they could even innovate on other things that they saw gamers do and all of the crazy videos with some of the combat and also with some of the traversal things so i feel that this game is also going to add far more of those little things to make for a different type of experience and to also make it to where you don't have to be an expert on the physics and the mechanics and everything in order to enjoy some of the things that other gamers did with stasis and combining stuff and using everything in order to manipulate the game. To me, I think that makes for a more well-rounded game, that makes for a better game, and if you start combining it with all the other things that I've talked about here, I think that you're going to get a game that honestly blows The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild out of the water because it fixes all the things in a game that people already considered to be top of the tier. And even if you go back and play The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild right now at this point, it's still incredibly fun to play. Even if there are flaws here and there, no game's perfect, be it that. But I love the fact that the developers here seem to have understood exactly what makes The Legend of Zelda tick and it looks like they're going to improve and fix everything on top of giving us a whole new experience with those sky areas with the underground and with the gameplay itself and that's what made the legend of zelda breath of the wild awesome and that's what's going to make the legend of zelda tears of the kingdom even better so i can't wait till nintendo shows us more on this but if you want to hear more of my thoughts on the legend of zelda tears of the kingdom and what i think they're going to do some of the stuff that i've talked about with what other people are discussing and so much more i'll have some links to my previous videos in the description or right here on the page you can check that out that would be much appreciated thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you for the next video peace